Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and today's episode is called Forgetting UFOs, Three Cases with Amnesia. Forgetting part or all of a UFO encounter is fairly common. It turns up a lot in onboard UFO encounters, but also turns up in sightings, simple sightings. This is a huge problem in this field. It's very strange because generally speaking, people describe their UFO encounters as something they think about every day, something they remember very vividly. But on the other hand, there's this weird amnesia aspect, which can be pretty pervasive and take on all different kinds of forms. I mean, it not only happens to one person, but can happen in crowds of people. So that's what I want to talk about today. I've got three cases I personally investigated, which I think perfectly illustrate this phenomena, and each involve what I believe to be an onboard experience. And we're all recalled to some varying degrees in varying different ways. First case I want to talk about is the case of the glowing egg. This case took place in Ann Arbor, Michigan, outside of Ann Arbor actually, in 1962. The main witness is Rob Baldwin. He's a really nice man. I met him when I went to speak down in San Diego. He was running this small UFO group and uh, told me about this incredible sighting he had had uh, in 1962, which he spontaneously recalled. So this case is fascinating. Uh, Rob, age 16, had heard about these sightings going on outside his t hometown and uh, became very interested in it and decided that he and his three friends were going to go UFO hunting and see if they could see these UFOs that the whole town was a buzz about. So they go out one evening and just drive around. They don't see anything. They finally end up in, on this little road in a farming community. It's called Denton Road. It's in Canton, uh, Michigan, right outside of Ann Arbor. And uh, they found this little dip in the road, a 50-foot long dip where it came down in elevation about 10 feet. So they were hidden from e cars coming on either direction, but still had a really good view of the sky. And they had parked there for just a short time uh, when something very strange happened. This UFO came zooming up and appeared right at the edge of this culvert, this little dip in the road where they were hiding. And I'll just let Rob describe in his own words what happened. Well, this is, uh, this is a, an incident that happened to me when I was about 16 years old. Here we go. So we're out in the country now. We'd, I'd heard about the swamp gas in this one area, and we're about uh, probably 10 miles outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we had just gotten settled in. We, we picked this old dirt road, and uh, it was literally in the middle of nowhere in farmer country. And, and there was just this one small little dirt road going straight out with the, with, here you can hold this just for me, with the, I have to use my hands on this, <laughs> with trees going over the top, which sort of embraced the road, cradle the road, and frame the road, actually. And on either side, you have dirt, uh, dirt uh, areas where the farmer raised their crops, primarily corn and soybeans and whatnot. So anyway, we're there. It's about midnight, hot, hot summer night, uh, about 1961. And uh, we just got there. And so we just settled in probably there 10 minutes. And we're in this little bit of a dip. Now, Michigan is very flat. And uh, we're in this little dip in the road. In fact, if you'd looked down the road, you probably wouldn't have seen our car. Not very smart uh, to be hiding in a dip in the middle of the road. But, you know, again, we were 16 years old. It was Michigan, midnight, uh, on a Saturday night probably. And believe me, nobody was traveling down that road, so we're pretty safe. So we're sitting, we're sitting in the car, just talking. Been there 10 minutes, as I said. And this, this structured craft, and floating down the center of the road, and it was about three feet off the road, just uh, just right in the middle of the road, and it looked like a giant egg. Now this this craft, I call it a craft because I, I know it wasn't an egg, and uh, it was probably about so oh, nine or ten feet from top to bottom, big the big part on the bottom, just as you would see in a gigantic egg, about five feet from side to side. Now this this thing had the most incredible 
incredible um, uh, colors. I mean, there there were the uh, the most beautiful reds and yellows and golds and oranges and pinks. The basic color spectrum, only the the uh, the perfect representation of each basic color in the spectrum. Now there it was. These colors were floating around kind of in blobs and all over the surface of this thing. They were all touching one another, but they, are, they never intermingled so that one color would run into another. The greens and perhaps blues would be together and they would just be kind of mushing together to all maintain uh, their integrity. They were floating around on the surface of this craft, basically uh, defining what the shape of this craft was. It was self-illuminated, but it wasn't like a big bright light. It was simply a light on the craft. No light really hit the ground. So it was a self-eliminated, very restricted uh, light source. I opted to start the car up and move towards this object. Now this object was probably only about probably 30 feet from the car. It was like literally right in front of us and all of us saw it. And, uh, we're, and on the angle of looking up through my windshield it was probably on an angle about like that. Perfectly in view, full view of everybody in the car. I start the car up. And as I started the car moving towards this thing, this thing just backed away from the from this little dip I was telling you about. Don't forget that. This ravine and we're kind of it's kind of going away from me. And for me, I accelerated the car. So I, I floored the car and this thing just went it just took off like a shot. An orange blur, like a gigantic cannonball, shooting down the road, but it was it was down the road and hit a hole in remember this canopy I was talking about. Hit a hole in the canopy and it was gone out of sight in maybe five seconds. So this is where it gets very strange. Uh, Rob does not remember what happened next. Uh, he doesn't believe they talked about it. And in fact, he remembers nothing more from that evening at all. They never discussed this event one bit. As Rob says, I don't remember talking about it after that. I don't remember talking about it at all. I don't remember anything about that night at all after that experience. Basically, the event was just warehoused for 25 years. Pretty strange. I don't remember anything. Nothing at all. So not only did they not talk about it, they didn't even think about it. In fact, the entire event was completely shrouded in amnesia for apparently all four of them. Uh, they were friends for a long time, and Rob finally moved away. Uh, he moved to California, and it was some 25 years later when he spontaneously recalled this event and was just blown away and wondered, you know, started to wonder what his friends remembered and uh, was delighted when the 30-year high school reunion came up. He's like, I'm going to my 30-year high school reunion and hopefully these guys will be there and I can ask them. So he goes to his high school reunion and sure enough, they're there. His three friends are there. And so he approaches them one by one and asks them what they remembered about this giant glowing egg they had seen. And again, this is where it just gets bizarre. He approached one friend and his friends denied the event ever happened had no memory of it uh, at all. So he approached a second friend, and the second friend's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Someone was playing a trick on us. Someone jumped out from the road and had flashlights or something. And that blew Rob away even more. One friend doesn't remember it at all, and one thinks it's people <laughs> with flashlights or something. Uh, Rob pretty much dismissed both those stories because he had a very uh, vivid memory of what happened, and it didn't match that at all. So finally he found his fourth friend, and the fourth friend, his story was just completely blew Rob's mind again. Uh, the fourth friend remembered exactly what Rob remembered initially. This object just suddenly appears next to them on the road, and is hovering at and watching them. And this is where his memory diverges from Rob. According to Rob's friend, they actually all four got out of the vehicle and were standing in the road looking at this thing. And they walked over into the field, into the farmer's field right next to the road. And this object followed them and hovered directly over them in this farmer's field. And that's all he remembers. 
He does not remember Rob chasing this object or this object shooting up through the, a hole in the canopy of the trees. So here we have a case with four boys, all who remember completely different versions of the same event. So this is a perfect case of how amnesia is such a huge problem in this field and can involve certainly more than one person. And to this day, Rob has no memory of what happened on that evening, neither do the other guys in terms of, you know, was there missing time? I think there probably was because these sort of varying uh, events, v these variations are sort of a red flag that investigators look for, indicating that perhaps there is a more extensive encounter. Second encounter I'd like to talk about by pure coincidence took place about 30 miles away from this other encounter. This is in the small town of Pinckney, Michigan, and I call this case beamed by a UFO. The main witness wants to remain anonymous. I call him Jay. And the incident took place when he was uh, 18 years old. And uh, this was in 1978. Again, out of the small town of Pinckney, Michigan. And it started out very similar. Uh, Jay had heard about sightings at a local farm not far from his house. Uh, apparently, this guy said UFOs were hovering over his farm on a regular basis, and the sightings were so predictable that people were going there in large numbers to watch these UFOs. So Jay and his friend decided that's what they were going to do on this evening. And uh, September 1978, they pile into his uh, car and uh, his pickup and drive off to this farmer's field. And they get there, and Jay cannot believe his eyes. There must be 300 people there. There's barely room to park. Cars are lining up both sides of the road. Uh, lots of people are there. It's a carnival atmosphere, festival kind of atmosphere. There's the news is actually there. There's a news station interviewing people. And yeah, as you said, 300 people are there. And uh, I'll just let him describe what happened. As Jay says in his own words, about 15 minutes after we got there, com coming directly south in line with this guy's field was what appeared to be a grid of 40 different vehicles. I guess you call them vehicles. Spinning. They kind of moved as one. And I remember them being red and yellow and kind of marbling their color, almost like a lava lamp. So everyone just stared silently up at this object or objects, Jay thinks it was probably one object because it moved in unison. Uh, but it, if it was one object, it had to have been huge. It wasn't quite easy to tell if it was one object or not, uh, but he was really struck by their strange coloration, the way it kept turning red and yellow and ha had this kind of marbling color, very much actually like uh, R Rob described in the previous case. So they're watching this, and this is again when things started to go from weird to much weirder. And I'll again just let Jay describe what happened. As uh, he says, nobody was freaking out and going ooh or ah, even myself. It was kind of a hypnotic effect like, oh, that's nice. Then people got in their cars and left like it was no big deal. You'd think that they would have freaked out on this. It's one of the biggest things I've ever come in contact with. But we got tired and left. They were still there when we left. We didn't care anymore. So this is really completely out of character. We have a group of 300 people who should be jumping up and down because they're being visited by what appear to be extraterrestrials. And what does everyone do? They decide they're just going to leave. And no one's talking about it. No one's jumping up and down and screaming. There's this weird calming hypnotic effect. Nobody's talking about it. And this is how this amnesia starts, I think. So Jay and his friend drive off, even though the object is still there. And the 
encounter is not over yet. In fact, it's just beginning. This is one of the most incredible nights of Jay's life. Uh, he was about to have a series of encounters that would change his life forever. So he and his friend head off down Highway 36. His friend lives on a dirt road off to the main highway. Jay drops him off and is heading back onto the main highway. It's a forested area when he sees a UFO again. It's got a different appearance. It appears much smaller and closer. It's hovering at treetop level and sending down beams of light randomly. This is a very remote area. There should be no reason a helicopter would be out there. And he's not close enough to quite hear it, but uh, he's in line with it. So he flicks his high beams at it a couple of times and it seems to react. Uh, and he drives up to this thing and leans out of his car. He can't hear any helicopter, but he does hear a low buzzing noise, a kind of a whirring, whooshing, buzzing noise. And this thing sends down beams of light around in the woods and then moves off towards the east. So Jay's like, wow, just seen two UFOs. This is amazing. And he's heading, gets back on the main highway, is heading east on Highway 36, and is just passing his high school, Pinckney High School, uh, where he went to school uh, and uh, looks up in the sky and hovering way up there, right above the football field, is another object. This one looks like a giant monolith, a huge black rectangle, like a domino, just hovering way high up in the sky. It's pretty high up there, uh, so I can't quite tell how big this thing is, but it looks big. And uh, it's just hovering up there, moving around a little bit. And he's amazed. He watches it as it scoots around and finally just moves off. So now he's really excited. He's seen three UFOs. All of them look different. And he can't wait to tell his mom. He's now about eight miles from home. And to get home, he has to turn off Highway 36. And he turns on to this gravel road. It's a well-maintained two-lane gravel road, so he can go pretty fast, about 50 miles, 55 miles per hour. He's got eight miles to go, and uh, he's just heading along through this very remote area. It's uh, state-owned land, forested. It's a crystal clear night, not a cloud in the sky, no fog, and suddenly he notices something very strange. The stars behind him are starting to disappear. And he can't quite make sense of it. He notices everything's kind of getting darker. And uh, he's looking around, trying to understand what's going on. He sees that stars are disappearing. He looks in his rear view mirror and can see what looks like this giant black object um, approaching. And it flashes some sort of lights. And so he slows down his car, stops, uh, he thinks he left the engine on. He certainly left the headlights on. He gets out of his truck, walks up to the front of it, turns around and sees this uh, object approaching. And it was apparently the same object he had seen hovering over the high school. It was giant black rectangle shaped object. This really pitch dark black, a non-reflective surface. Uh, that was just the blackest black he's ever seen. And he's jazzed. He's amazed. This thing is approaching towards him. And it's pretty darn low. It's like maybe 150 feet. And I'll just let him describe what happened as this object approached him uh, as he stood in front of his car. As Jay says, my first reaction was, this is great. Come here. Then it got closer and I started to realize how darn big it was. I mean, this thing would have dwarfed our field. I think they could have put 30, 40,000 human beings in this son of a gun. It was like having some major building, like the United Nations building, turned sideways and held over your head, ready to drop. This thing was bigger than a battleship. This thing dropped down on me and then it wasn't funny anymore. I started to get a weird fear. So now this thing is about 100 feet overhead 
and things start to get stranger. It starts flashing all these lights, beautiful colored lights that moved randomly in this weird sort of swirling pattern across the surface, the bottom of this huge, huge object. Uh, it was beautiful to, to see. He said it was red, green, orange, blue, uh, swirling all over, no p particular source that he could see, uh, just kind of appearing these weird random patterns. At the same time, he could feel this incredible sense of electricity and static in the air. Uh, all his hair was standing up on edge and uh, on his arms and on his head. So he could physically feel this thing. It was making this low thrumming, humming noise. And he's just staring up at it in complete awe. Uh, and, you know, some trepidation. He's freaking out certainly a little bit when suddenly this thing sends down a beam of light. How he described it is if you were to take a holy cross and put him on the bottom of this thing, this, the beam of light came out right from the center of the cross and it struck him. It was a thin beam of light and it reminded him kind of like, you know, a flashlight from a police officer, except it was a very strange light. It was almost solid. It had sort of a chalky gray, blue look to it and it, it struck him and he said it was very powerful. It almost felt like something was going through him, like this was some sort of x-ray and he was being beamed by it and they were getting all kinds of information or something that, or there was some sort of communication there. Uh, it really freaked him out. Uh, it took place only for a few seconds and retracted, uh, much like a normal beam of light. And uh, after it retracted, this object started to lift up very slowly. It, the noise increased a little bit and it moved off. So Jay at this point was keeping pretty close attention to the time. This was around 11 p.m. He does not believe he had missing time. Uh, now he was very excited and could not wait to go home and tell his mom that he had seen four UFOs in a row and had just been beamed by one of these things. So he heads home at top speed, reaches his house, and tells his mom she does not believe him, from accuses him of being on drugs, hurts his feelings really bad, so he retreats to the barn and starts to play his guitar. He goes up into the hayloft and starts playing his guitar. Uh, but wait, there's more. His encounter wasn't over yet. He's playing his guitar when suddenly he hears this humming noise again. And again, things get really weird. He starts to feel sort of hypnotized or entranced. He meant to jump out and, you know, see if he could see this object, but he didn't. Instead, he just kind of sat there listening to it for he doesn't know how long. Uh, he had this weird sort of sense of time. He's not sure how long he stayed there, five, ten minutes. Finally realizes what's happening and jumps up, climbs down the ladder and throws the barn doors open and gets a real shock. The, there's a wall of fog really, really thick fog encasing his entire farm area. It's so thick he can't see more than 10 feet. Uh, he's completely shocked. This can't, this can't be true. He was just there a few minutes, he thought, you know, 15 maybe. And uh, there's this wall of fog. Next thing he knows, he's back up in the hayloft playing his guitar, hearing the sound of this object, this low humming noise, move slowly away off into the distance. And that's all he remembers. As he said, something's not right. Uh, some, I would have gotten up and investigated. That's not what he did. So this case is just pervasive with amnesia from the very beginning. From, from when he saw this giant UFO, UFOs with a crowd of 300 people, including his friend, to seeing this other object and apparently having missing time at the end of this night here. I think this probably does involve an onboard encounter. Uh, he has no memory of this, no dreams, uh, but this is this pattern we see. Uh, 
And uh, he did later have more sightings. He became an aircraft mechanic, actually. Joined the military as an aircraft mechanic. Got stationed in Gulf Breeze, by coincidence, or not. And was later st stationed at uh, Area 51, of all places, Nellis Air Force Base. And continued to have sightings. Uh, he eventually moved to California, where he became a fairly well-known actor. Uh, very interesting case, and apparently, as far as I know, still has no memories of ever being on board a UFO, uh, but I think probably it did happen. And the third case I'd like to talk about, I'm definitely convinced this person had an onboard experience because of these three cases, this person was able to overcome his amnesia spontaneously in a very interesting way. Uh, this case I call Five Hours on Board a UFO. It's an incredible case. He contacted me after uh, finding out I was a UFO researcher and hearing about my UFO research. And I call him Jack. That's not his real name. And uh, he had one of the most incredible UFO encounters I've ever heard. Uh, Jack grew up on a small farm in Nampa, Idaho. The, his case occurred in 1972 at age 12 when he, his mom, and his younger brother decided to go to the drive-in movie. And uh, they were going to the Late Show, and uh, the movie was going to start when suddenly this wall of fog moves in very quickly and completely obliterates the screen. It's impossible to watch the movie, so they get a refund and start heading home. Their home's not far away, just a few miles, but the fog is so thick that they have to inch along the road at a very slow pace, and they're inching along when suddenly his mom stops the car. Uh, Jack's brother is in the front seat, Jack is in the back seat, and Jack's brother and Jack's mother shout out, look, look at the skunk. And Jack looks out the front window and he doesn't see anything. He says, what skunk? And his mom and brother said, look, it's right there in front of the car, a three-foot-tall spotted skunk. Uh, there's no such thing as a three-foot-tall spotted skunk. Uh, this was an abnormally large and very strange-looking skunk uh, that both Jack's mother and brother were staring at in disbelief. The problem was Jack couldn't see this skunk at all. And he puts his uh, head right next to his mom, right next to his brother's, and there's nothing there. But his mom and brother insist there's this weird-looking animal right in front of the car. And at this point, it gets weirder. Suddenly, this light starts approaching the car. And Jack's mother says, oh, look, it's a crop duster. And Jack's brother says, yeah, it's a crop duster. And uh, Jack looks at it, and it doesn't look like a crop duster to him. It's got two sort of beam uh, circles of light approaching them. He says, that's not a crop duster. And suddenly, their car fills with light, and he starts to feel this sense of weightlessness. And at this point, he starts to feel a real fear because he can't quite understand what's happening when the light suddenly blinks out and uh, his brother turns around, grins stupidly, and says, see, I told you that was a crop duster. And they drive off. They drive home and uh, the fog is lifting. They reach home and it's now morning. It, there, it's light out. Jack can't believe it. And he's like, hey, hey guys, it's light out. And his mom says, no, it's midnight. You're looking at the clock wrong. Go to bed. And Jack turns to his brother and says, look what time it is. His brother says, it's time for bed. And they all just crawl into bed. And Jack was freaked out because his, his mom and his brother were like hypnotized, like under mind control. And that freaked him out. And he himself doesn't really remember anything except just going directly to bed and waking up the next day around, you know, in the afternoon. This was very unusual. They were a farm family. They had to wake up early to care for the animals. And uh, they all woke up around 4 p.m. or so, and no one talked about it. No one said a darn thing about it. And uh, 
They just completely forgot about it. And as Jack says, and I'll quote him directly, none of us discussed this event after this happened. I didn't ever talk to my mom about it. My brother never talked. We just never talked about it. Uh, I call this the silence after the storm. And this is very common, particularly with onboard UFO encounters. People not only don't talk about an amazing UFO sighting, uh, they completely forget it. It's just gone from their minds. And that's what happened to Jack. Uh, there were a lot of strange events that did follow this event. Uh, again, this occurred when he was 12 years old. But following that, these weird sort of crop circle patterns started to appear in the fields in their farm in Nampa, Idaho. And some of these were quite large. That, you know, cornfield, the corn would all be knocked down in a circle or circular pattern. Uh, also a wheat field. They had a three-acre wheat field. And one time, this crop circle appeared, and it covered two acres. Jack's mom blamed Jack for doing this, and Jack denied it. He said, I did not do it. Uh, he couldn't have done it. It was two, two acres wide. It had all these weird pinwheels coming off of it. It wasn't just a circle. And besides, he had better things to do than stomp down two acres of wheat. Uh, his mom theorized that maybe there was magnetic vortexes or tornadoes. They never did figure out what was doing it, but it happened several times. Jack did notice one pattern, which was that the animals would never go near this thing. Uh, none, no animals would ever go near these areas where there were crop circles. So there were other strange things that happened. Jack was an avid skier, but whenever he would go skiing, he'd have this weird physical effect. His feet would become numb. The center of his heels would become so cold and would remain numb for hours afterwards. It was something he just couldn't figure out, but it wasn't a huge problem, so he just sort of dismissed it as one of those physiological peculiarities that turn up. And, you know, he's still just a kid. And more weird things happened when he was a kid. He's age 17, he needs to have four wisdom teeth removed. The oral surgeon pulls out the teeth and says, oh, this is strange. We have something else here. Uh, Jack is under the influence of laughing gas. He's still conscious. And the surgeon says, we have this object under one of your teeth. I'm going to have to pull it out. It's about the size of a tooth. might be another tooth, uh, you know, a hidden tooth. But it wasn't a tooth. The, d the surgeon said he's never seen anything like it. The nurse had never seen anything like it. Uh, they weren't sure what it was and ended ju up just discarding it, uh, presumably as some sort of uh, biological thing, uh, and uh, weren't able to explain it. Jack uh, remembers this vividly, but didn't know what to make of it. Uh, that same year, another very strange thing happened. Uh, Jack was 17 years old. Jack was at high school playing football when he broke his leg. Broke it badly in three places. Three clean breaks, three compound fractures. Had to be rushed off to the hospital. They took x-rays and imaged his leg. And uh, as they were treating him, they, they asked him if he had broken his leg before because he had these metallic looking objects, what appeared to be uh, steel pins in his ankle near his leg, on his left leg. And Jack denied it. He said, no, he'd never broken his, broken his leg before, which he hadn't. Uh, so that was another weird thing. And so he's kind of dismissing all these sort of weird things one by one and doesn't know what to make of them uh, because other than that, his life is normal as far as he can tell. Uh, life continues, he grows up, becomes an adult, uh, takes a job in a factory, ends up moving to Everett, Washington, gets married, has kids. It's 25 years later, it's now June of 1997, and something very strange happens. Jack is in the kitchen and bites down on his tooth too hard in the wrong way and cracks one of his molars wide open. It was very painful. And as this 
stab of pain goes through his body, he's instantly transported back to age 12 when he's on board a UFO. And in a matter of minutes or seconds, really, he recalls what happened to him when he was taken on board a UFO at age 12 and had five hours of missing time. And uh, he remembered it in detail and other events as well. Uh, he was real shook up. He had to sit down and uh, just take it all in as these memories swirled through his brain. He remembered everything that happened. And I'll just uh, tell you what happened to Jack during these five hours because it's an amazing event and it's got some unique details that I've never heard before. Jack remembers uh, driving, you know, leaving the drive-in. His mom and his brother say they see this skunk. They see this light approaching their car. Jack and his mom think it's a crop du duster. You know, the, the light hits him. Jack, you know, at that point in the conscious version of events, Jack's brother turns around and says, see, I told you it was a crop duster. Well, now Jack remembers what happens. He remembers the light hitting him, feeling the sense of weightlessness and the sense of fear when suddenly he's pulled up through the roof of the car. He goes directly through the roof of the car um, uh, without any obstruction and starts, you know, he's going up. He's hanging upside down. He's pretty afraid, not so much for himself, but for his family. And he feels like he's in telepathic contact with these guys who are pulling him up. And he says, don't hurt my family. Don't hurt my mother or my brother. And, and the beings responded, don't worry about them. They'll be fine. We don't need them. We need you. They'll be fine. Don't worry. And next thing Jack knows, he finds himself inside this object. His first impression is that this thing is much larger than he thought. It was this huge building t sized object, uh, pretty big room. He, and he said it w was fairly well lit, but there was no lighting source, no lamps, no lights that he could find, just indirect lighting. Uh, there were no corners. There was a completely rounded room. And it was also very strange in its color. He said it was kind of this dull, brassy color, like the color of brass. It was the best way he could describe it. Sort of metallic looking. And uh, it was just pretty much uh, this huge object. He's placed on this table, which is floating there and the table melds to the surface of his body. He kind of sinks into it, and all these beings surround him, a crowd of them, maybe 10. And it's very strange, he cannot remember these beings. He does not know what these beings look like. Uh, he does not remember, uh, but he has the feeling they were short and perhaps shocking or in appearance per or unpleasant to look at. Uh, but no, he can't remember. But what he does remember is that it w they, they had this very strange way of communicating. They communicated in a sort of hive mind. And every decision they had to make, they sort of took a vote, like a jury. And they, they were playing this sort of good cop, bad cop with him. But some of them would say, oh, we should just put him back, throw him out. And uh, another would say, no, we're not going to do that. We need to examine him. And as they started talking, this is the impression he got that they had kind of a hive mind, that they were very logical, not emotional at all, and had to take a vote on every single decision they made. Uh, there did appear to be a boss, um, head figure in charge and another guy was much more friendly he played the good cop and was kind of the doctor and was the guy who was communicating mostly with Jack telling him you know don't worry this point 
Jack said, what about my family? What about my family? And they again reassured him and said, don't worry about them. They'll be fine. They, they, they'll be fine where they are. We don't need them. We need you. You'll be back soon. And so J Jack felt some reassurance. He was still pretty scared. He was looking for a way out. He's examining this craft. There's this weird partition on one side. And on another side, he can see what looks like, a, well, not a doorway. It's not really an escalator or, or maybe an elevator or a ramp going upward. Uh, it's very unfamiliar to him, and he had a kind of a lot of difficulty describing it. Uh, but it, he definitely gets the impression this is a very large space. These beings are surrounding him, looking at him like he's some kind of a puzzle. Some seem disinterested and just want to move on, and others are like, no, no, we need to examine him. And uh, that's what they do. They've, he sees some of them move towards his feet, and they start pressing these instruments into his heels. And he can physically feel it, and it's a very cool instrument. He, his feet feel very, very cold, and uh, they're pressing him into his heels. It's not painful, but he definitely can feel it. And then one of them moves to his mouth. He has, they instruct him to open his mouth and they're putting some kind of instrument in his mouth. And uh, the examination continues on for a short while. And he's not sure what happens next. But after some point, they finish. And they lift him up and start floating him around the craft. He's not walking, he, he's just floating. And they float him from room to room. He doesn't really remember much except suddenly they pull him into what, the center of the craft and drop him down. They put this sort of bungee cord-like device around him and drop him down out of the craft and dangle him out of the bottom of the craft. He's in this clear diamond-shaped container. It looks like plastic or glass. It's diamond-shaped. He's dangling out of the bottom of the craft. And he gets a clear 360 degree view. He can see the bottom of the UFO and he can see his farm and all the terrain around this area for miles around. Uh, he can see the road leading up to his farm, the telephone poles, he can see the fog, it's a foggy night. Uh, he can see everything and wherever he looks, this thing swivels around and turns. So he gets a perfect 360 degree view. It's disorienting at first, but he sees it's actually really cool, and he starts playing with it and uh, just whirling around and looking around, enjoying the view, and does this for several minutes until some point they pull him up and uh, they dart down over his farm and right over the telephone wires. And he can see this through a portion of the craft that becomes transparent, this is something I see all the time. People don't describe windows. Instead, they describe looking out through the craft and a portion of the wall becomes transparent or the floor. And that's what happened here. Jack's looking down uh, through part of the floor and the side of this craft. And one of the beings is explaining what's happening, that they're pulling electricity out of the telephone wires. This beam of light comes from the UFO, hits the telephone wires, and starts pulling electricity out. And it was a huge amount of energy. It just powered up this UFO. This is something we see a lot with sightings. Um, you know, I don't know of any cases where someone's been inside a UFO and watched this happen, except for this one. Uh, so this case might be unique in that regard. Uh, but I'm sure there are other <laughs> cases out there. Uh, but that's apparently what Jack was witnessing here, them stealing power from our electric lines. He could physically feel it. The whole craft itself buzzed with electricity. Uh, it was very uncomfortable for him. It was a very cold feeling. He says it was phys physically cold, and it actually made his teeth hurt, like biting on tinfoil or something. Uh, so he could physically feel this, and the being was explaining all kinds of things to him at this point. Uh, most of went over his head. I mean, he just didn't understand it. It was a lot of geometry, he said, being thrown at him. He saw shapes, squares, circles, triangles, all kinds of math formulas. 
but most of it just went completely over his head. And so he's not sure how long that went on either. So all these different events were happening to him. And next, uh, this craft started darting around and they took him to a couple of places, he says. Uh, he doesn't remember them. He does not remember what happened. He does remember at some point seeing very unfamiliar terrain, uh, Earth-like as far as he could tell, uh, but definitely not a place he recognized. And after that, the craft darted again. It would dart around like a bullet, and suddenly they're over his car, and he's being pulled out of the craft, and he's in this beam of light, heading head first down in this beam of light. And he says, it's kind of fun. And he's enjoying it and starts doing flip-flops and just having fun. And he again asks about his family, and they said, don't worry, they're fine. Uh, don't worry. And he's placed back into the car and placed on the seat. And the beam of light retracts. And his brother turns around grinning and says, See, I told you it was a crop duster. And they drive home. And that's what he recalled. Uh, maybe not the full five hours, but certainly a good portion of it. So now it's 25 years later. Jackson is kitchen, trembling and shaking as after he re remembers all this, after he gathers his wits, he calls up his brother and asks him about this incident. His brother remembers nothing, does not remember this incident at all. And uh, he decides he's going to call his mom and asks if she remembers. And he calls his mom and his mom's like, yeah. I do remember seeing that skunk, a three-foot-tall spotted skunk. That was really weird. And Jack's like, Mom, you know, there was no skunk. I was right next to you. I didn't see any skunk. And uh, do you remember the light? She's like, oh, yeah, the crop duster. I remember that. And he's like, what else do you remember? You know, do you remember when we got home? And she's like, yeah, I do remember that. It was morning, and I, for all these years I've been wondering... Why the heck I kept you boys out all night? Well, Jack nearly fell off his chair when he heard that. That was all the confirmation he needed. His mom remembered what happened. She remembered the light. She remembered the missing time. And this gave confirmation enough for Jack to think that you know his memories of what he recalled were real. Uh, now suddenly all the weird events made sense. The crop circles, the cold spots in his ankles, the weird object in his tooth, the object in his foot. So all these things finally made sense and uh, really shook him up. He also remembered about two weeks after this incident, his bedroom filled up with light. This beam of light came in and he was sucked out of his bedroom right through the closed window and into a craft. And he doesn't remember what happened after that. So uh, here's a case where he had amnesia for 25 years, uh, did not even know about the event, and then spontaneously remembered only because he cracked his tooth. I'm not sure he would have remembered had he not cracked his tooth. And this makes me think there are a lot of people who may have been abducted, taken on board a UFO, and have no memory of it at all. Or people who may have seen a UFO and have no memory of it whatsoever. It's very strange. Why would a UFO show itself off to someone, uh, obviously wanting to be seen, and then completely erase the memory? So yeah, I, this is something we run into all the time. These three cases I took from my book, Extraterrestrial Visitations, True Accounts of Contact. And uh, a lot of these cases in that book had this problem. Uh, some people, of course, are able to remember their memories through the use of regressive hypnosis, which I support. I think it's a fantastic and very effective method to recover memories. Uh, but my point is that this, the fact that there is such a strong amnesia aspect to these encounters really skews our numbers of, in terms of any estimates of how common this type of experience is. 
If people don't actually remember it, I'm thinking the number of sightings, number of onboard encounters is far, far more common than people think. And uh, we run into this all the time. I mean, there was one lady, I, was inter I interviewed her about her encounters. I'd done several interviews. Uh, she had seen this weird light um, over her house. She was across the street. I was interviewed her about that, called her back a week later to do a follow-up interview, and she had no memory of the event. And not only that, she didn't remember me interviewing her, had no memory of me actually calling her up and interviewing her about what she had seen. Uh, so both of these events were shrouded amnesia. I'm like, listen, I've got you on tape um, about what you saw. So that freaked her out, freaked me out. It shows that this can be, you know, retroactive, that amnesia can come some time after the event. So that's why I think this is important, uh, that uh, there are a lot of cases out there. This is a very pervasive problem, and it's one that I think needs to be addressed more aggressively. And uh, that's kind of the reason why I did this video. And it would be my recommendation to people even if you see a UFO, write it down immediately, even as it's happening. Because I do know of cases of people who found their notes and uh, saw that they had recorded a UFO sighting which they had no memory of whatsoever. So that is fascinating to me, uh, this whole amnesia aspect. So let's watch out for that. And that's why I did this video, to guard against UFO forgetfulness and forgetting UFOs. So that's my presentation for today. Once again, thanks very much for listening and keep having fun.